This week, the NTSB makes safety recommendations for air racing in the wake of last year's Reno accident. We get the preliminary results from Howard Purdue's accident last week, and you'll get a wrap up of last week's AEA convention in Washington, D.C. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. As we were wrapping up production of this week's Airborne, we got some late breaking news. Jim Campbell reports. ANN is following up on details involving an MV-22 Osprey accident that occurred Wednesday in Morocco. The United States Marine Corps MV-22 was crewed by four Marines, two of which were fatally injured and two of which have been medevaced with severe injuries. According to the DOD, the Osprey was operating from the amphibious assault ship USS Iwo Jima when it went down in a Royal Moroccan military training area southwest of Agadir, Morocco. Four Marine Corps personnel were on the aircraft at the time of the incident. The MV-22 Osprey was assigned to Marine Medium Tilt Rotor Squadron VMM-261 at Marine Corps Air Station New River, North Carolina. The squadron was operating from the Iwo Jima at the time of the incident. The Iwo Jima Amphibious Ready Group with the Embarked 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit are participating in Exercise African Lion, a bilateral exercise conducted with Royal Moroccan Military Forces. The annual exercise is scheduled to be conducted through the 17th in a designated military training area. Exercise African Lion is a bilateral theater security cooperation exercise led by U.S. Marine Forces Africa and is conducted annually between the U.S. military and the Kingdom of Morocco to further develop joint and combined capabilities. The cause of the accident is under investigation. Keep an eye out at www.aero-news.net for further information. As the Marine Corps releases it, we'll make sure we get it to you. In the meantime, this is Jim Campbell for the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course, Airborne. NTSB Chair Deborah A.P. Hersman held a news conference in Reno on Tuesday to announce recommended changes in how air races are conducted in an effort to improve safety. Quote, we are not here to put a stop to air racing, Hersman said. We are here to make it safer. While the investigation is ongoing, Chairman Hurstman provided a detailed interim update that showed that the accident sequence initiated with an upset that preceded the separation of the left elevator trim tab by approximately six seconds. One key safety area highlighted during the investigation is the extensive modifications made to airplanes that race in the unlimited class and the lack of documentation and inspection associated with those modifications. On the Galloping Ghost, modifications included reducing the wingspan from about 37 feet to about 29 feet and significant changes to the flight controls all designed to increase speed and enhance racing performance. Among the recommendations made by the NTSB include engineering evaluations of the aircraft and a better method to track discrepancies in documents associated with those evaluations. The NTSB also calls for an evaluation of the feasibility of requiring pilots to wear G-suits when racing at the Reno National Championship Air Races. They also called for an evaluation of the design of the unlimited class course and safety areas to minimize maneuvering near and potential conflicts with spectators with changes implemented if necessary. We're still recovering from last week's AEA convention, which is maybe understandable after nearly 1,500 avionics manufacturers, dealers, installers, and other general aviation professionals gathered for the convention in Washington, D.C. Among the show's highlights were the introduction of nearly 30 new products and an exhibit hall filled with new and updated avionics and other gizmos. There were also plenty of sessions with regulators and the announcement of the Association's Member of the Year, along with the awarding of about $100,000 in scholarships. AEA President Paula Dirks opened the show with an aggressive statement, quote, This year's convention's theme is take pride, take ownership, take back your industry, she said. Attendees demonstrated a positive outlook toward the future with a collaborative spirit of cooperation. 
Dirk said AEA's members are focused proactively on growing their businesses and developing leaders, which was evident throughout the four days in training sessions, the exhibit hall, and our interactions with the regulators. Next year's convention is slated for March 25th through the 28th in Las Vegas, Nevada. A rule published last month in the Federal Register means that pilots who have been provided with a special issuance of a medical certificate no longer have to carry that letter with them when they fly. The FAA says it doesn't know of anyone who has had to produce their letter of authorization during the three-year period the rule had been in effect. For this reason, and because of a long-standing FAA operational requirement that pilots carry their medical certificate when exercising pilot privileges, the FAA has identified this regulation as one that can be done away with. But pilots still have to carry their pilot certificate and medical with them when they fly. The change is open for comments until May 21st and takes effect July 20th, 2012. John Collins, 81, and his 80-year-old wife, Helen, were flying home to Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin from Marco Island, Florida, in their Cessna 414A last week, when John passed away at the controls of the airplane. Helen, who according to family members had flown in the past, but not for 30 years, and never in the 414, was forced to take matters into her own hands. The story does have a happy ending, however. Television station WMNN in Michigan reports that Helen Collins suffered only minor injuries when she finally got the airplane on the ground, but it took the efforts of several people to bring the flight to a good resolution. Another pilot who was acquainted with the Collins took off in a Bonanza to fly alongside Helen in the 414, and he guided her through several practice runs before attempting the actual landing. Low on fuel, Helen eventually lost her right engine on the last approach. Local authorities said that the plane landed hard on the runway, bounced, and then went down nose first, skidding across a grassy area before coming to a stop on its nose. Helen Collins suffered only minor injuries as a result of the rough landing. The county medical examiner confirmed that John Collins had passed away during the flight and his death was not caused by the hard landing. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. An updated Aviator's Model Code of Conduct was released last week, which is designed to help pilots develop a higher level of proficiency. Tom Patton has more. The Aviator's Model Code of Conduct, or AMCC version 2.0, was released last Friday by the project's permanent editorial board. Developed by a team of aviation professionals and drawing on decades of research and experience, the code promotes ongoing improvements in flying quality and safety. AMCC version 2.0 reflects the knowledge and experience gained from extensive research, consultation, and draftsmanship of previous versions. Pilot's conduct impacts the entire aviation community, including its safety culture. The AMCC represents a set of guidelines that is adaptable to each pilot and organizational need. The Code of Conduct has received extensive industry review and presents a vision of aviation excellence within its seven sections. Those include general responsibilities of aviators, passengers and people on the surface, training and proficiency, security, environmental issues, use of technology, 
and the advancement and promotion of aviation. The code is periodically updated to reflect changes in standards, practice, and the aviation environment. Other codes of conduct developed by the industry are geared toward aviation maintenance technicians, flight instructors, glider pilots, LSA pilots, seaplane pilots, and student pilots. Each is available as a free public service with supporting materials available online. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. The NTSB has issued a preliminary report in the tragic death of Texas pilot Howard Pardue, who was killed last week in an accident involving his vintage World War II F-8F Grumman Bearcat. The report, citing witness testimony from another pilot, suggests Pardue was performing a low-level aerobatic maneuver when the accident happened. The witness told the NTSB he had taxied into position and radioed Pardue that he wanted to observe his takeoff before departing himself. Pardue allegedly radioed back that he was going to perform a half Cuban 8 aerobatic maneuver after takeoff and then overfly the runway in the opposite direction. The witness stated that after liftoff, the accident airplane climbed 100 to 200 feet in a shallow climb before it pitched up into a near vertical climb. The airplane continued the climb in an inside loop before leveling out, inverted about 500 feet above the runway, heading the opposite direction of the takeoff. The witness then saw the airplane's wings roll suddenly before the airplane entered a near vertical descent. The witness described the final portion of the aerobatic maneuver as a split S maneuver or a descending half loop from which the airplane was unable to recover before colliding with terrain on a southeasterly heading. Dassault's newest aircraft, the twin-engine Falcon 2000S, has completed its first year of flight testing. As of today, the test aircraft has accumulated nearly 300 flight hours and more than 100 flights. The rigorous test flight program has demonstrated and confirmed the expected performance of the airplane. Outfitted with inboard slots and winglets that work together to reduce landing speeds, the 2000S also features a unique auto brake system, which will allow it to access shorter and more challenging runways than any other aircraft in its category. The first part of the test campaign included numerous maneuvers to demonstrate handling qualities, including stability, stalls, pitch, roll rates, and failure mode tests, as well as evaluating the aircraft during takeoff following engine failure. Future portions of the campaign will evaluate VMCG and VMU, as well as air inlet distortion around the engines and maximum crosswind demonstration. In later phases of the certification processes, engineers will test and fine-tune the aircraft's anti-ice system and verify the integration of EZ-2, the next generation of Dassault's proprietary avionics suite. Certification is anticipated for the end of the fourth quarter of 2012. It was an accident which could have turned into a real tragedy, but fortunately, while there was considerable property damage, no one was fatally injured. When an F-A-18 Hornet departing the Navy's master jet base in Norfolk, Virginia, impacted an apartment building in nearby Hampton Roads. Witnesses said they saw fuel being dumped from the jet before it went down. Virginia Beach EMS Division Chief Bruce Nadelka told CBS News that fuel was found on several buildings and vehicles in the vicinity of the accident. Nadelka said the fuel dump prevented what would have been a massive fireball when the jet impacted the building. The jet had departed NAS Oceana. The apartment building is located in the nearby Hampton Roads area. Three buildings were reportedly destroyed and two more were damaged, according to CBS. Admiral John C. Harvey Jr., Commander, U.S. Fleet Forces, said a full investigation would be conducted into the accident. The Navy said this week that it would compensate those who had lost their homes in the accident. In just a moment, safety is on the mind of ANN's Editor-in-Chief, Jim Campbell, and he'll talk about it in this week's Barnstorming Commentary. I'm Ashley Halinger, Airborne on Aero TV. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, 
and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFT540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidyne. Thanks for joining us. Unfortunately, we had a lot of accidents to report to you this week. Sometimes that's just the nature of aviation journalism. Well, let's put safety on the mind of ANN's editor-in-chief, Jim Campbell, as he discusses in this week's barnstorming commentary. Jim? Thank you, Ashley. And well, obviously, Ashley's uh, week this week had a little bit too much uh, tragedy to report on, and we don't like it any more than you do. But there are lessons to be learned and things to be thought of. And I want to talk about this dirty little secret that we as pilots don't really like to talk about that much. And the fact that we're very fallible human beings and even more fallible as aviators. Because basically, physics are a bear. And physics will often conspire against us if we are careless, if we don't prepare adequately, if we're not trained properly, if we don't pre-flight properly. These are the things that conspire to get us. And while we may all think we're God's gift to aviation and, and superior aviators in every way, plain fact of the matter is physics may disagree. We can be more prepared. I've spent way too much time on airport ramps watching a guy pull up in his car, pop on out, kick the chocks out of the way, light it up, and be on the runway in a minute or less without a pre-flight, without enough time for the engine to warm up and stabilize. Often, I wonder if enough time even for an Adahars to stabilize. Things of that nature. And you have to know that this guy is not prepared to fly. I hear about pilots talk about conditions that they're heading into that they haven't flown in in a while or not prepared for. They've never dealt with this or that. They're not sure, but they blunder off anyway. And while that's all, you know, it sounds very macho on the outside, what it means to me is it's just plain stupid. We are better than that. We were taught better than that. The rigs demand it. The circumstances demand it. The profession demands it. But let me get to the heart of the matter. The people who care about you demand it. You may be God's gift to aviation. You may be double big care. You may not have enough respect for your own well-being to do a proper pre-flight. But your family, your wife, your children, your significant other, whatever the case may be, your spouse, uh, your friends, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever the case may be, they're going to miss you. They're going to hurt. They're going to feel awful. And if that's what you want to leave behind, then you're not much of a human being and you're certainly not much of a pilot. We need to do better. We must do better. As somebody who was left behind in a, by an aircraft accident through no cause of the pilot involved, and as you know, there was a tremendous amount of pain in it for me. Even three years later, I have to tell you, it's a bone-jarring, gut-wrenching, awful pain to deal with thinking about that person. Did they hurt? Were they scared? Was there pain? Did they know what was happening before it happened? All these things go through a loved one's mind when they think about somebody who's had an accident and been, uh, and been erased from the face of the earth. If you don't have enough respect for yourself, have enough respect for the people who care about you. Pre-flight better, train better, prepare better. Do whatever is necessary to be better pilots and as a result, better human beings better members of your family, better spouses, better everything, so that aviation can uh, go forth with a safer and more positive attitude, and these horror stories that are left behind become more and more rare. I have to tell you, it's no fun being a survivor, and more important than anything else, it's certainly no fun to see people not survive their carelessness. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell. The host of a fishing show appearing on the Outdoor Channel was fatally injured Friday when the Comp Air aide he was flying went down shortly after takeoff in the Florida Everglades. Jose Wahabi, 54, was the only person on board the aircraft when it went down. NaplesNews.com reports that authorities say they did not know where Wahabi was headed when he took off from Everglades Air Park. Witnesses said the plane had climbed to about 2,400 feet before impacting the ground in an empty field near the airport. The NTSB said there was a significant post-crash fire, smoke from which could be seen for two miles or more. The Cuban-born Wahabi had hosted fishing shows on both ESPN and ESPN2. His current show, Spanish Fly, was carried by the Outdoor Channel. He had also recently produced a special which appeared on Nat Geo Wild. 
For all you hopeful test pilots out there, it's time to get your resumes in order. Eligible pilots, combat systems officers, and engineers have an opportunity to join the ranks of air power pioneers like Jimmy Doolittle and Chuck Yeager, but they have to apply for U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School to do so. The 2012 U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School Selection Board will convene in July to fill openings for July 2013 and January 2014 class start dates. All officer and civilian applications are due to the Air Force Personnel Center by June 1st. The TPS trains pilots, combat systems officers, and engineers to develop, test, and evaluate the newest aircraft and weapon systems in the fighter, multi-engine, helicopter, and remotely piloted aircraft categories. The 48-week course consists of four closely related curricula, experimental test pilot, experimental test combat systems officer, experimental test remotely piloted aircraft pilot, and experimental flight test engineer. The U.S. Navy has grounded a fleet of helicopter drones after two of the aircraft crashed overseas within a week. The robotic spy chopper used by the Navy, known as the MQAB Fire Scout, was developed by Northrop Grumman. It was first deployed to war zones in Afghanistan and Libya last year. In the first incident, the Navy said a fire scout crashed off the coast of Africa on March 30th after it was unable to land on the Navy frigate Simpson at the end of a surveillance mission. On Friday, another fire scout crashed in Afghanistan. Quote, in light of the recent mishaps, the Navy has temporarily suspended fire scout flight operations for 14 air vehicles in inventory while system performance and operational procedures are reviewed, the Navy said. The Fire Scout, which is remotely controlled by a pilot on a ship, has reportedly experienced problems in the past. A couple of airline notes to pass along this week. The FAA is investigating an incident which occurred last Tuesday in which a United Express pilot requested an emergency landing after reporting smoke in the cockpit, but the controller dismissed it as a prank. The Denver International Airport air traffic controller apparently misunderstood the flight's identification and dismissed the declaration of an emergency. The Associated Press reports that controllers realized the mistake when the pilots radioed the tower again, saying that the plane had landed and passengers were being evacuated. Firefighters were dispatched to the airplane at that time and put out a fire in the instrument panel of the airplane. One person was taken to a local hospital and treated for unspecified injuries. The airline had no comment. Meanwhile, several American Eagle flights headed to the Colorado ski town of Aspen were diverted to other airports over the weekend because of airport equipment failures. Investigators say that navigation equipment failed on Saturday and Sunday. The FAA says it has had problems after moving the equipment and expects it to be fixed by Friday. And now it's time for our AVW, the Aero Video of the Week. This week, one of ANN's good friends and a contributor with us in Oshkosh 2010 has been working for, let's just say, a few years on a Kit Fox project. Dan Billingsley, a school teacher and carpenter, has finally realized his dream of a personal airplane. Our AVW this week is the first flight of Dan's Kit Fox. To find this video and more from Dan's Kit Fox flight, go to YouTube and search for Dan's First Flight. The full video runs about 50 seconds. If you have a suggestion for a future Aero video of the week, send us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Finally this week, not since the days when Pan Am stewardesses had to pass a girdle check has the airline industry seen a story quite like this. In an effort to fight ever-increasing fuel cost, Ryanair is asking its flight attendants to take it off. Extra pounds, that is. The low-cost airline has already begun using plastic cups, less ice and passengers' drinks, cutting the size of its in-flight magazine and printing it on a lesser-quality paper, all in an effort to keep down the weight. 
pounds transfer into fuel, fuel into rising operating costs, and rising operating costs into higher price tickets. The airline says it will do anything to keep its costs low. Ryanair is already well known as a supporter of the so-called fat tax, asking its plus-size passengers to pay more for adding weight to the aircraft. Now comes the call for flight attendants to take it off. The weight, not their clothes, of course. However, female flight attendants are even being encouraged with the promise of an appearance in the annual Girls of Ryanair calendar. But there's no word on any incentive for the male flight attendants. Hmm. Get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.